Warning. You've reached on the box with great comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. We're so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to join us on the box with Tony and Mark and myself. How you doing, Tony? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? Good. Good. What have we got? Uh, well, <laughs> we're going to go a little bit off the script. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was engaged in a conversation on Twitter with this young lady who asked this question. I said, you really want me to lose my job, don't you? But I asked you before we started if mm -hmm. it would be okay to ask this question, so I'm going to ask this question. Uh, the young lady asked, Ray, why are your socks so long? And I've got the answer. Before I answer this, I made sure I checked the length of the socks of Mark and Tony, and they're exactly <laughs> the same size socks. So the problem is, my legs are short. That's why my socks look long. You know, that's the perfect answer. Certainly that is. is the perfect answer. Now, mm. Mark, do you get your socks at Walmart as we do? Uh, you know, I don't. I go to Costco. Uh, Costco uh. has uh, socks for tall people. But it's the same <laughs> size as Ray, I just found out. Well, that's where I get my sleeping bag from. <laughs> socks. Yeah, I just soon I get a sock each and we yeah. sleep in the no, socks. Costco has the best prices, so that's where I get my socks. Yeah. Costco's prices are better than Walmart's prices? Uh, well, they I, last better. I don't know if they we're... Uh, we prices should, or the socks? Should we uh, be talking both. about... Walmart and Kmart. And yeah. Costco. Well, we're not we're not bagging on them. No. Okay. And we're not encouraging people to go shop there, are we? Unless they want. Yeah, unless you want to. I mean, you do socks. whatever you want. I mean, we're <laughs> going to be as politically correct as we possibly can be. Yeah. All right. So the sock question is out of the way. But I guess something else I'd like to discuss. Go right ahead. It's got to be better movie, than socks. I watched the movie in the weekend. Uh, Robinson Crusoe. Robinson okay. Crusoe. Okay. Now you're famous. I don't know if this generation know about him, but in our generation or generation before. It's a classic story, Robinson Crusoe. Um, the movie was made in 1950, and it just blew me away because it kept talking about the Lord. Well, did you, you could know in 1950. Yeah, but did you know Robinson Crusoe was written by Daniel Defoe, right. who was a Christian, yeah. and the character was a Christian who was ungodly at the beginning of his isolation, and he became godly as time. You know all this? Well... How come yeah, you didn't I'm tell almost me? as old as you are. Yeah, how come you didn't tell me? I didn't, had no idea Robinson Crusoe was a Christian saturated. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware that I was supposed to keep you abreast of oh, yeah, listen to classic this. literature theological characters. I found this on Wikipedia, so it must be true. It's got to be true. <laughs> Robinson Crusoe is filled with religious aspects. Defoe, that's the, the writer, was a Puritan moralist and normally worked in the guide tradition, writing books on how to be a good Puritan Christian, such as the new family instructor, the religious courtship. The biblical story of Jonah is alluded to in the first part of the novel, like Jonah. Crusoe neglects his duty and is punished at sea. At, I don't know what that word is, of the novel is the Christian notion of providence. Yeah, providence. <laughs> Penitence and redemption. Crusoe comes to, a repentant of, uh, to repent of the follies of his youth. He learns to pray to God. First, by randomly opening the Bible, he reads the words of Psalm 50, where he reads, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Crusoe often feels guided by the divinely ordained fate, thus explaining his robust optimism in the face of apparent hopelessness. That thrills my heart. You know, we yeah. should we should remake. I know if they remade Robinson Crusoe, it'd be yeah. I can imagine what it'd be like now. Just about all of the movies we watch in our house are 1950 mm -hmm. or older. Now that uh, was in color. Yeah, yeah. No, there's some movies as late or as early as uh, 1939. Yeah, absolutely. Or 38 yeah. that are in color. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, and our socks would have been white either way, <laughs> black and white or in color. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Do you always wear white socks? Uh, only when I wear shorts, because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Englishmen on the beach in England wearing black socks and thought to myself, boy, that looks kind of sick. <laughs> black socks. No offense to Englishmen. But Mark wears black socks. socks on Tuesdays, but that's a whole other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you sent this to me, Ray. I did. You did this morning, demanding it be on the show, and so we're going to do it. What is that? Oh, this thing. Yeah. It's how just, did you it was just this? Uh, uh, Trish sent it to me. Oh well. And okay. it was just weird. I didn't even want you to go to the site because it was it was a not not a nice site. So yeah. I cut and pasted it. But of course I went to the site yeah. to get more background on the picture and to find a better 
image, yes. but yeah, we did. So, anyways, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, here's yeah. a picture that Trish found, who sent it to Ray. This artist, his name is Rafael Lo Lopez Ramos. He's calm, friendly, and attentive, according to the article. Uh, within a whirlpool of national symbols, corporate logos, plastic containers, stood Rafael Lopez Ramos. Uh, on Saturday, July 7th, the Cuban expatriate unveiled his first New York exhibit, Wonderland, at 17 Frost Theater of the Arts. Uh, provocative show interweaves American icon iconography with consumer goods to critique the growing decadence of a globalized world. And somehow he decided to use one of our... It looks like one of our now, billion it is, it dollar is one bills. Of a, now, he's not going to hear from our lawyers, but I'm certain he's going to hear from Disney's lawyers because that looks a little bit like Mickey Mouse. Well, but if it's, an, if it's an editorial image, though, but I think But if he's getting money it. from it, then I think that when that comes in the equation, things change when you use the image. Remember you know what? what happened Mickey, in Florida? Mickey runs the happiest place on earth. No, no, in he's Florida. He's a tiny little <laughs> mouse with a falsetto <laughs> voice. What is he going to do? He is a billion dollar industry, and in Florida, a daycare center was threatened by lawyers to take Mickey off the wall or Disney was going to sue them, and they did. So our, now I'm sure you have Manuel on this already, trying to get in touch with this artist to find out why he used our billion <laughs> no, dollar bill. No, not at all. Why? <laughs> Let's why. make some news. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Maybe we can get him on the show. <laughs> Share the gospel with him. Yeah. Tell him why his art is so... It's better than some. It is. Mm. It is. Mark! Just wanted to wake you up before we move to you. Do you have a thought on Mickey and our billion dollar bill? No, I no? think Mickey okay. should hand out billion dollar bills to everybody that goes into their theme parks. There you go. I think uh, Brad would have something to say about that as well. He loves Mickey. That's right. Yes. He does not. Does oh, he? No, yeah, yeah. If we Is ever call Mickey for fan? a boycott for Disney, <laughs> Brad will be the rebel. <laughs> he's, if he's not here, he's at Disneyland. Uh huh. Oh, really? With his family. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, they love the place. All right, Ray. Uh, we're going to read an obituary that I've edited as we're waiting for the show to start because you're going to give me a hard time about the lamps. <laughs> this is uh, Val Patterson's obituary. It uh, appeared in the Salt Lake Tribune. He wrote it himself. So it's an auto obituary. It's an auto obituary. Yes, it's an auto obituary. Mm. Yes. Uh, 1953 to 2012. I was born in Salt Lake City, March 27, 1953. I died of throat cancer on July 10th, 2012. I don't. Someone must have added that. This must have been like... <laughs> we this figured that. Well, this, this it, had to be it's like Joshua writing the end of yeah. Deuteronomy, right? Un only Jesus could do something like this. Yes, and, and, and he was. No. I've had great joy living and playing with my dog, my cats, and my parrot. But the one special thing that made my spirit whole is my long love and friendship with my remarkable wife, my beloved Mary Jane. I loved her more than I have words to express every moment spent with Mary Jane was time spent wisely. Over time, I, I became one with her, inseparable, happy, fulfilled. I enjoyed one good life. Traveled every place on earth that I ever wanted to go. Had every job that I wanted to have. We'll find out in a moment why he got some of his jobs. And uh, learned all that I wanted to learn. Fixed everything I wanted to fix. Eaten everything I wanted to eat. My life motto was anything for a laugh. Other mottos were if you can break it, I can fix it. And don't apply for a job, create one. I had three requirements for seeking a great job. One, all glory. Two, top pay. Three, no work. Now that I have gone to my reward, I have confessions and things I should now say. As it turns out, I am the guy who stole the safe from the Motor View drive-in back in June 1971. I could have left that unsaid, but I wanted to get it off my chest. Also, I really am not a PhD. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was that the day I went to pay off my college student loan at the University of uh, Utah, the, the girl working there uh, put my receipt into the wrong stack, and two weeks later, a PhD diploma came in the mail. I didn't even graduate. I only had about three years of college credit. In fact, I never did even learn what the letters PhD ever stood for. Uh, for all of the electronic engineers I have worked with, I'm sorry, but you have to admit my designs always worked very well and were well engineered and I always made you laugh at work. Now to the really mean park ranger. After all, it was me that rolled those rocks into your geyser and ruined it. I did notice a few years later that you did get Old Faithful working again. To Disneyland, you can now throw away that 
banned for life file you have on me, I'm not a problem anymore. And SeaWorld San Diego, too, if you read this. Uh, if you knew me or not, dear reader, I am happy you got this far in my letter. I speak as a person who had a great life to look back on. My family is follow following my wishes that I not have a funeral or burial. If you knew me, remember me in your own way. And if you want to live forever, then don't stop breathing like I did. No Sen jokes. This is what the man wrote as his yeah, obituary. Yeah, he's got a tongue and tree some cheek of, sense. Some of it. Mark, what does PhD stand for? You, did you check it out? It's a doctor of philosophy. That's what a PhD stands for. And then you obviously you're a doctor of different areas, different specialties, but that's what it means, doctor of philosophy. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. This is where you learn stuff. That's right. Like Budapest. Yes. So, Tony, what did you get out of this? Not much. I was hoping you would get something well, out of it. No. Did you? Yeah, I brought tears to my eyes. It did me too. Now. It me too. Oh. No, I actually I did. Ray, I'll, I mean, I'll let you go first no, after you go I go. First. No, you no, go no, first. Me no, first. I, no, I no, no, me first. Me first. Me first. Okay. Well, it led me over to the actual uh, uh, place where he's being buried, and I saw a slideshow. And when you have uh, nice music attached to all the memories that this man's accumulated through the years, you see his family. You see them laughing. You see them crying. You see the things going on, and I was just thinking about my own mortality, my own wife, and he had said that, boy, he, he loves his wife, and he's sorry that he, it sounds like it was a self-imposed cancer uh, based on how much smoking and stuff that he had done. And there's a picture of him with a, a hole inside of his neck. Tracheotomy. A tracheotomy, right. Man, I, I, I feel for you, you know, for something like that. And what's left behind? You know, it made me immediately call up my beautiful bride and just tell her how much I love her. And um, my heart goes out to his family. I don't know if they'll ever see this, but if there's one thing that I think he could share with you today, it would be don't miss heaven. Don't miss heaven. You, you may live and have a great time here on earth, or you may not have a good time here, here on earth. It's irrelevant to where are you going to be 100 years from now. Because all of us won't be here a hundred years from now. Where will you be? And if he could plead one thing with you, it would be to get right with God. And the way you know you need to get right with God is by examining the Ten Commandments. You shall not steal is the Eighth Commandment. You don't need to steal a million things to be a thief. He stole his PhD and he stole a safe. He's a, he's a thief. If you've ever told one lie, you're a liar. You don't need to say a hundred lies to be a liar. If you dishonored your parents, you're guilty of breaking another commandment. The last commandment says you shall not covet. Have you ever strongly desired something that belonged to somebody else? If so, you're a covetous individual. Ever use God's name in vain? You're a blasphemer. And what these commandments do, they show us who we are in truth and the way God sees us. So you can look at your loved ones and say, hey, they're pretty good. And undoubtedly, they probably are. But according to whose standard? Who gets to decide what good is and what bad is? I dare to say God alone gets to say what good is and what bad is, and that's what is representative inside the commandments. Well, God, having that perfect knowledge, knowing that your loved one could never make it to heaven, he had a plan. It was the ultimate plan in that God himself would become a man, born of a woman, born of a virgin. He paid the ultimate price by dying on that Roman cross overlooking the town dump. And if you would be willing to turn from your sins, it's called repentance, and place your trust in Jesus Christ. The same way you would a parachute if you were, were to jump 10,000 feet out of a plane. You place your, all that you have into that parachute. Well, you do that same thing with Jesus Christ. Well, in that he paid the ultimate price, you turn to him, repentance, you place your trust in him, you're going to be granted a free gift. I don't know where your loved one is. I don't know where this guy's at. I'm not dare to say whether he's in heaven or hell. But I do know those are your only two options. And if God gives all of us justice, well, then you end up in hell. Well, I don't want that to happen to me, and I don't want that to happen to you. So if you confess and forsake your sins, place your trust in Jesus Christ, turn from your sins by simply turning towards him and saying, God, now what? I'm done living for myself. I want to live for you. You're granted that free gift, and that free gift is everlasting life. You don't deserve it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. And the best way to say thank you is by surrendering your life. The moment you do that, you get that hope of heaven. And the reason I know that God will receive you the way you are is because three days after Christ died, he rose again from the dead and he defeated death. It's called the resurrection. 
and you can have that hope of heaven yourself. I look at the life that this guy lived, and boy, it's quite the life. I guess we can agree to. Isn't that so? But don't miss heaven, and that's what he would say to you. Don't miss heaven. Don't miss it. Place your trust in Christ. Stop living for yourself, and surrender your life to Christ while you still have time yourself. Uh, Boy, how good it is to hear the gospel. I've heard it once or twice before in my life, and to hear it again is just thrilling. Christians should never tire or get bored at hearing the gospel. So tell me what you got out of this. Well, I think it's a tragic example. I mean, all obituaries are tragic. You know, and this guy sounds like, I mean, writing his own obituary, sounds like he was probably a, a neat guy to be around. He obviously loved his wife, loved the people around him, um, had a sense of humor. But I think this is a tragic example of this notion that God wants you to live your best life now. And if all you have, if the best you have is your, is your best life now, uh, eternity is not looking good for you. If, if mm. this is your best life, then what awaits you is hell, mm. you know, and uh, and it's tragic to you know, to read this, um, and and it shows that everybody has a conscience. Everybody has a conscience that is constantly at work. He might have suppressed some of these things for many years. Mm. Maybe he didn't even tell some of the people he loved about some of his indiscretions in youth. But for whatever reason, as the world would say, but we know because God is real and He's given us a conscience, he felt compelled to confess certain hidden sins before he died. Mm. Yeah, it, it made me, uh, uh, well, up tears in my eyes because of, of the tragedy and the horrible circumstances in which he died and his family, as Mark was saying, that broke my heart. But one thing I noticed is, is uh, there's a huge, huge sin that's evident right through everything he's talking about, one that most of humanity wouldn't even notice, and that's the sin of ingratitude to God. Every single blessing came directly from the hand of God. His eyesight, his ear hearing, his ability to think, his ability to love, have dogs, cats, parrots, his, his wife, everything, the travel, everything came from the gracious hand of God. And the first and greatest commandment is to love God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There is not an ounce of vertical gratitude to God. And if we just want to feel what the sin of ingratitude is like, try dealing with it in your own life. Do something for someone and have them totally disregard what you did for them. No thanks, no gratitude, and it just, it, it upsets us. And how much more does it upset God that he gives us life and we don't say, God, thank you so much. I love you with my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful for the very breath you've given me, the ability to see, ability to think, for my loved ones. There's just not an ounce here. It's all kind of hedonism. Yeah. It's all is just selfishness, and, and it's just typical, normal human nature. And then on top of it all, after we live a life of absolute selfishness and ingratitude and ungratefulness we say I'm going to my reward as if God owes us something when he owes us nothing but justice so that's why it broke my heart and uh, very very sad and, and every time I see a young person smoking I think how crazy they're going to end up like this guy throat cancer or lung cancer and they're going to die a horrible death and bring um, anguish to their loved ones so uh, let's learn a lesson from it Amen, Amen. We got a 180 testimony um, via our 180 Facebook page. This is from Austin. Watched 180 last night. I've considered myself a Christian for some time now. I've also been someone who believed that legal abortion was okay. I'm now ashamed of that fact and beg God to forgive me for being complacent about murder. Thank you for turning me around. Well, praise the Lord. That is so wonderful. And we just, we get a lot like this and they're probably on the tip of the iceberg. God's doing wonderful things through that. 3.2 million views on YouTube. Who wow. would have believed it? I mean, that's a lot. Yeah, for a half-hour documentary. I yeah. mean, people have a hard time watching anything for three minutes, let alone 33. And then we've got Dr. James Dobson promoting it this Thursday and Friday, yep. and it's got 800 stations. So if you uh, want to listen in, make sure you, we're going to send out a blast today, I think oh, it good, is, or good. tomorrow. What's today? Wednesday. Tomorrow. We're sending out tomorrow or during the night. So send it on to your friends. Who knows? Just one, who knows, one click of your uh, mouse could save a life. A lot of people are sharing about the upcoming um, appearance on uh, James Dobson's radio show on Facebook. Oh, Seeing good. That quite a bit on Facebook right now. That's great. All right, this is from Jennifer via Facebook. I have an objection question I received from some I received from someone who is in favor of abortion, and the objection goes like this: So you're saying we should fill up the adoption house? How many kids have you adopted to help out, to help out banning abortion? 
How would you go about addressing this? Thank you for all that you do. My husband and I love the show. We've heard this one before. Oh, okay, you want to stamp out abortion, but how many children are you going to adopt? It's like saying <laughs> we should keep killing Jews because you're not taking them into your home. So we'll just kill yeah. them because you're not prepared to take them into your home. It's ridiculous. It is. It's stupid. But in their own small minds, it's justified. That's, they say, oh, yeah, that's a good argument. Duh. Yeah. It's just stupid. Mark? That's, that, that's, I mean, that, that's a great analogy right there. Um, I, I would stick with what, uh, with what Ray said. I, I think that's a great response. I think that the premise is faulty, so obviously yeah, the conclusion there is faulty. I had a family reunion uh, recently, and one of my relatives had said, hey, Mark, I think that you need to uh, watch these certain shows. And he mentioned a show that I've never seen three seconds of, but I knew that it was beyond terrible. And he said, well, how are you going to know what it's about and to tell, keep your children away unless you actually watch this yourself? I said, well, that, that's like saying, hey, you need to shoot up heroin in order to relate to the person who's shooting up heroin. You know, or you need to be a prostitute or be with a prostitute in order to say prostitution is wrong. There's something wrong there in their premise, so therefore the conclusion is faulty. So, yeah, I... What do you do with something like that? Don't answer a fool according to his folly, right. unless you be like him. There's an old saying that, I don't know if I can use it on this program, but I'll, you don't have to put your head down a sewer to know that it stinks. Yeah. It's, it's, a, bit, <laughs> it's a bit coarse, but it gets the message across. Yeah, it, it, the bottom line is it's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous question. It's a ridiculous uh, assertion. We should uh, therefore justify murder if we should be in favor of murder of unborn children if we're unable to adopt children. Mm. Makes no sense whatsoever. Super. All right, uh, Mark's going to try to uh, round up a couple of questions out of the chat room for us. We got a little extra time. He is now. <laughs> that, well, that was that we, you know, it was solid. in the business. Yeah. You know, now that I'm in it, we refer to those as cues. Very good. Yeah, yeah, I'm learning, so they're often secret, but that's okay. Uh, this is from Sean, a pastor in Vermont. <laughs> Praise God! Love the combination of teaching and joy. We should be the most joyful people on the face of the earth. We are redeemed. And through abiding, Jesus wants our, wants our joy to be full. Thank you for freely expressing joy, joy in him, love, and appreciate your ministry very much. I had to read that. Is he talking about this program? He's talking about the program. Oh. Well, thank you, Sean. That's really yeah, good. Because from time to time, we get emails from people who say, love your show, hate the humor. We do? Yeah, we do. We actually yeah. do. I yes, we I do. I don't see that. We do. The last guy that emailed with us, so I think he's like... Uh, Couple cans short of a six pack, you know. Just uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> got a sharp spoon, spoon, huh? Maybe has a Santa Ana wind condition below in between the ears. But you know, that's another thing. But anyways, we're thankful for Sean and and folks like him who find our humor humorous at times. Well, they find our humor. <laughs> no one else can. <laughs> Let's cross over to Mark for some subtle. We're crossing. Uh, yes, crossing, crossing over. over. Studio. Uh, you know, somebody's. You're going to be in the Bay Area this weekend, right, Tony? I am. Is that, San Jose, anyways. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I was looking online. I can't find the info. Do you have any info? Somebody lives up in the Bay Area. They want to know where you're going to be. Uh, can you fill us well, in? Well, you go on that to uh, NorCal, N-O-R-C-A-L, Seed Sowers, all one word, dot com, and you will find information there for the NorCal Fire Conference. It is uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, July 20th and all day Saturday, July 21st, and then we will be we will be hitting the streets of downtown San Jose on Saturday night as a group to proclaim the gospel. Well, may you have some burritos thrown at you. Yeah, who knows? Mm. It, it will be dark, so <laughs> yeah, people have a tendency to throw things in the dark. So is that the only question, Mark? Nope, you there's, have? there's yeah. actually all kinds of stuff. Uh, is it possible for us to put all of our books and materials up on Amazon because it's much easier to buy from Amazon than from the United States. What do we do with that, right? Can we can we put stuff up uh, on Amazon? How's that work? I don't even know. I said what, Daniel? There's already a few things on there, but we can't do any more. It's quite it's quite a quite a few things on Amazon, but apparently we can't do any more. Okay. Anyone from Living Waters planning to go to the Super Bowl outreach in January, February, two thousand thirteen? <laughs> you would be, wouldn't you, Mark? I. Boy, where is it at? It's in New Orleans. It's in New Orleans. Yeah, I've been asked to go lead a team. You went. You just went to the last one. Didn't I just you? went to the last one, and that's where I got hit by the burrito. Yes. Or the hoagie, or the submarine sandwich, or whatever. It was it is. a good pass. Huh? Good pass. It was a good pass. Yeah, I think it was a spiral. In mm -hmm. fact. 
Yeah, so send tickets and Tony and Mark will be there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, there well, go. I guess this will be probably our last one here. It seems to be a bit of a serious one. Uh, my niece is going through a deep, dark depression. She has an infant with Down syndrome, and she's unmarried and had the baby out of wedlock. How do I witness to them both? How do I share the gospel? So I guess, how do you share the gospel with the, the child who has Down syndrome, and how do you witness to the, the niece who has the child out of wedlock? I think you witness them like you would everybody else. There's no difference. I mean, we often use the analogy when people are going through a tough time, should we share the gospel with them? Mention sin and judgment and righteousness. Well, take it to a plane where everyone's going to have to jump out of the plane just because the guy next to you has got a broken leg and he's in pain. Should you tell him about the parachute or just let him jump without it? No, you just hope that his pain doesn't distract from the sobering message you've got for him. And so just address this lady's conscience, do it in love and in gentleness, take it through the commandments and the grace and Tony. Yeah, I, I guess I would have a few questions. How old is the child with I, I, Down syndrome? Yeah. And, and uh, how um, Baby. severe of a case of Down syndrome does the child have? You know, uh, is, the, is the child able to communicate and, and understand? So those would just be some questions that yeah. I would want. But, but I agree with you. I wouldn't sugarcoat the gospel no. in any way for someone who is, uh, who is depressed or is uh, dealing with trials and tribulations. Uh, because you don't want to simply bring them to a, a worldly sorrow that leads to death. You want to bring them to a, a, a godly repentance through the, through the law and through the gospel. Mm. Anything else, Mark? We've got 29 seconds. How can teens witness to women who are going to abort their babies, friends perhaps in high school, things of that nature? Tell them, Ty. With a great deal of urgency, with a great deal of passion, and tell them the truth. Tell them they are about to kill their baby. 180. 180.com. Hand them, uh, get the 180 business cards, get the 180 DVD, uh, very inexpensive, and put those into your friend's hands. In the womb, the uh, gospel booklet we have uh, based on the National Geographic special, yes. In the Womb. And All good resources. Thanks for that, Tony. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us. We'll catch you tomorrow, God willing. For questions about On the Box with Ray Comfort or to submit questions for future shows, please email onthebox at livingwaters.com. That's onthebox at livingwaters.com. On the Box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel. Thank <laughs> you.